வணக்கம் இன் அன் அதர் வீடியோ ஐ ஹேட் ஸ்போக்கன் அபவுட் இன்ஜுரிஸ் டு தி எக்ஸ்டென்சா டெண்டன் இன் ஜோன் ஃபைவ் பட் ஐ ஸ்போக் ஒன்லி அபவுட் தி இன்ஜுரி டு தி டெண்டன் பெர் சே பட் தெர் இஸ் அன் அதர் இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் ஆஸ்பெக்ட் ஆஃப் தி எக்ஸ்டென்சா டெண்டன் அட் ஜோன் ஃபைவ் தட் இஸ் அட் த லெவல் ஆஃப் த மெட்டகாப்போ ஃபெலஞ்சல் ஜாயின் தட் கேன் ஆல்சோ கெட் இன்ஜர்ட் அண்ட் தட் கேன் ஆல்சோ காஸ் அப்ரிஷியபிள் ப்ராப்ளம்ஸ் இன் தி யூஸ் ஆஃப் த ஹேண்ட் தட் இஸ் த சர்ஜிட்டல் பேண்ட் as opposed to the injury to the extensor tendon per se the injury to the sagittal bands are usually closed injuries hence difficult to diagnose and sometimes difficult to treat also this video will deal with the management of the injuries to the sagittal bands we have already discussed injuries to the extensor tendon per se in zone 5 you can click on the icon above to see that video in this video we shall be discussing the injuries to the sagittal band and these injuries are as important as injuries to the extensor tendon the sagittal bands arise from the volar plate of the metacarpophalangeal joint and the deep transverse metacarpal ligament run dorsally on either side of the metacarpophalangeal joint and encompass the extensor tendon on the dorsal aspect though it is present on both the radial and ulnar side of the metacarpophalangeal joints of the fingers the sagittal band on the radial side is much thicker than the ulnar side sagittal band this is because the forces tend to pull the extensor tendon towards the ulnar side the radial sagittal band is thick and prevents this ulnar relocation of the extensor tendon while flexing the fingers there are three important functions of the sagittal band first it is a primary stabilizer of the extensor tendon at the metacarpophalangeal joint the juncture tendinum are the secondary stabilizers as mentioned earlier the sagittal band resists ulnar deviation of the tendon especially during metacarpophalangeal joint flexion and finally we need to remember that the sagittal band prevents tendon bowstringing during metacarpophalangeal joint hyperextension the sagittal band can get injured due to traumatic causes like forceful resisted flexion or extension which leads to a rupture of the band usually this is a closed injury it can also get injured by laceration of the extensor hood which is an open injury or a direct blow to the metacarpophalangeal joint which could be open or closed the sagittal band can also rupture in atraumatic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or even spontaneously during routine activities when the bands are attenuated it is interesting to note that the rupture of the sagittal bands occur commonly in boxers and amateurs so much so that this injury is sometimes called the boxer's knuckle in these situations it is the sagittal bands of the index and mid fingers that are involved and the ring and little fingers are involved in amateurs the middle finger is the most commonly involved and in the middle finger it is the radial sagittal band which is more commonly involved in fact in a ratio of 9 is to 1 when compared with the injury to the ulnar sagittal band ruptures or lacerations of the sagittal band in a transverse direction do not cause much of a biomechanical disturbance but ruptures or lacerations in the longitudinal direction cause problems the severity of the problems caused depend on many factors for instance sectioning of the ulnar sagittal band does not lead to extensor tendon dislocation but it is a major problem with the sectioning of the radial sagittal band even in the radial sagittal band distal sectioning does not lead to instability but even 50% proximal sectioning leads to extensor tendon subluxation and complete sectioning of the radial side sagittal band will lead to extensor dislocation and this effect of dislocation and subluxation of the extensor tendon over the metacarpophalangeal joint is more with wrist flexion and with metacarpophalangeal joint flexion let us just assume that this book is the extensor tendon on the dorsal of the metacarpophalangeal joint which is represented by my head and my right hand and forearm 
represent the radial side sagittal band. When this radial side sagittal band is ruptured, the tendon slips towards the ulnar side as the forces tend to pull the extensor tendons towards the ulnar side always. So, when there is an injury to the radial side sagittal band, example the midfinger, the extensor tendon which is held over the dorsum of the metacarpophalangeal joint dislocates and falls into the gutter between the middle and ring finger metacarpophalangeal joints. Injuries to the sagittal band can be classified into three types according to the Rayan and Murray classification. Type 1 is where there is a sagittal band injury without tendon instability. Type 2 the sagittal band injury with tendon subluxation and type 3 sagittal band injury with tendon dislocation. When there is an injury to the sagittal band, the patients usually present with symptoms of pain or metacarpophalangeal joint soreness, sometimes swelling, localized tenderness over the metacarpophalangeal joint and sometimes a snapping sensation with extension or flexion. A clinical evaluation will reveal tendon snapping on flexion and extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint, ulnar deviation of the digits at the joint and this is seen in an extreme condition in rheumatoid arthritis. Sometimes there will be an inability to initiate extension that is the patient can hold the metacarpophalangeal joint in extension once it is placed there but he will be unable to extend the finger from the flexed metacarpophalangeal joint position because the tendon subluxates and loses its biomechanical advantage. Sometimes this snapping that takes place at the metacarpophalangeal joint from subluxation and relocation of the extensor tendon may mimic a triggering of the finger. The phenomenon of the extensor tendon dislocating into the intermetacarpal gully during metacarpophalangeal joint flexion is most unstable with the wrist flexed and least unstable with the wrist extended and pain may be elicited when extending the metacarpophalangeal joint against resistance with both the interphalangeal joints kept extended. This is a provocative test. Finally, the extensor quadriga effect may be seen. That is, when even a single finger sagittal band is involved, for example, the mid finger sagittal band, it will lead to flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint and sometimes a swan neck deformity. And patient's inability to extend the mid finger will also cause a weakness of extension of the other uninvolved fingers due to the loss in tone of the juncture tendine. This is called the extensor quadriga effect. To evaluate further, radiographs of the hand PA, lateral, oblique views, the Brewerton view and the stress view need to be taken to rule out collateral ligament injury or avulsion injuries. A dynamic ultrasound evaluation is very important. It is indicated either as a confirmatory test or when swelling obscures the physical examination. Subluxation of the EDC tendon relative to the metacarpal head on metacarpophalangeal joint flexion will be noted. The findings on MRI on the other hand would be poor definition, focal discontinuity and focal thickening in an acute injury the dislocation of the extensor tendon into the ulnar side intermetacarpal gully in the case of a radial sagittal band defect can also be made out. Though the clinical features of sagittal band injury are quite obvious, there are situations where other diagnoses may mimic these findings. In collateral ligament injury of the metacarpophalangeal joint, similar symptoms and findings may be seen. In a rare case of rupture of the extensor distorum communis tendon 2, the symptoms may be seen. A trigger finger may also give the same appearance of tendon snapping in a sagittal band injury. Disruption or injury to the junctura tendinum can also cause a slight ulnar deviation of the finger at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint. Congenital sagittal band deficiency and metacarpophalangeal joint arthritis are the other differential diagnosis. Having made a diagnosis of rupture of the sagittal band, let us now consider the treatment modalities available. 
The most important management is the non-operative management with splints. An extension splint or a yolk splint is applied for 6 weeks. This makes sure that the metacarpophalangeal joint of the injured finger is always kept extended in relation to the metacarpophalangeal joints of the neighboring fingers. At the same time, it allows interphalangeal joint extension and flexion. It is indicated for acute injuries, that is, the diagnosis is made within 6 weeks. The operative management consists of two modalities. One is direct repair of the rupture in the sagittal band and the second is extensor centralization procedures. The direct repair method advocated by Kettlecamp is indicated in chronic injuries that is more than 6 weeks where primary repair is possible of the ruptured sagittal band. In acute injuries, we are always going to apply a yoke splint. But in chronic injuries, the healing of the sagittal band may not be strong enough to allow complete movements. Direct repair is also indicated in the professional athlete for whom the strength of the metacarpophalangeal joint flexion and extension are very important. The repair is done using 5-0 polypropylene suture with crisscross overlapping sutures after freshening the edges of the ruptured sagittal band and making sure they come together. However, this sort of repair is not usually possible in chronic injuries because many changes take place once the rupture of the sagittal band occurs. After injury to the radial side sagittal band, the ulnar side sagittal band will get shortened the juncture tendinum will be shortened on the same side and the ruptured radial sagittal band edges will be enmeshed in scar tissue and hence we will not be able to suture the ends together. So for these patients we will have to release the contracture on the ulnar side sagittal band and the juncture tendinum on the ulnar side and also reconstruct the defect in the radial side sagittal band. And this procedure is called the extensor centralization procedure. It is indicated in all chronic injuries where primary repair is not possible. And also in the professional athlete. There are many techniques of reconstruction of the radial side sagittal band. And we shall see the basis of all these techniques. In the wheel done technique, the ulnar side juncture is sutured to the radial side deep transverse metacarpal ligament reconstructing the radial side sagittal band. In the McCoy technique, the extensor tendon is split distally and wrapped around the lumbrical muscle which is volar to the deep transverse metacarpal ligament. It is then sutured to itself. In the Carroll technique, an ulnar distally based slip of extensor tendon is wrapped around the radial collateral ligament. In the Elson technique, however, a radial distally based slip of extensor tendon is wrapped around the deep transverse metacarpal ligament. In the trapdoor flap technique, a partial thickness capsular flap is created on the dorsum of the metacarpophalangeal joint. The extensor tendon is placed deep to the flap and the flap is re-sutured to the capsule. This ensures that the extensor tendon stays on the dorsal aspect of the joint. The same principles are used in other techniques like the Kilgore technique where a radial distally based slip of extensor tendon is wrapped around the radial side collateral ligament. The Watson technique is similar but here the distally based slip of the EDC is looped under the deep transverse metacarpal ligament and woven back to the remaining EDC. The ruptured dorsal end of the radial side sagittal band can also be reattached to the bone by a mitec micro anchor suture fixation. Sometimes facial strips or free tendon graft may also be used to reconstitute the radial side sagittal band. As in any hand surgery reconstruction procedure, the rehabilitation is very important. For the first two weeks, a resting splint Keeping the metacarpophalangeal joints and the interphalangeal joints at 0 degrees is important. After 2 weeks, this splint can be removed and a yoke splint is applied. Keeping the metacarpophalangeal joints at 0 degrees, interphalangeal joints free, 
and this is done for most of the day up to 4 weeks. From 4 to 8 weeks, active range of movement exercises are started at the involved metacarpophalangeal joint and using the yoke splint at night. After 8 weeks, progressive strengthening exercises can be started. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about the other extensor injuries and the zones of extensor injury. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning and surgery, plastic surgery and trauma surgery. Panakkam.